The Connect ASEAN Cultural Diplomacy Forum is organized to celebrate the upcoming 20th anniversary of the ASEAN Gallery established inside the Heritage ASEC building. Now, while waiting for more people to log in, let's have a game. So please log on to menti.com and enter the code. And uh, that's uh, just gives a just give a thumbs up once you've lo once you're logged in, and so we know when to commence the game. Uh, let me sh let me share the screen. Just a sec here. Yep. Can you see it? Uh, let's wait for a sec for more people to log in. So the game will consist of three questions. It's uh, simple uh, questions about, uh, in, in this particular uh, questions, it will be more about cinema related to ASEAN and Republic of Korea. Maybe if you've enjoyed some movies this year, you'll be able to point out some of the answers you might be able to guess. So yeah, uh, so maybe let's wait for a bit more for people to log in. So for the first question, as you might know, the newest Disney princess, Raya from Raya and the Last Dragon, is Disney's first Southeast Asian princess. And the first question will be related to her. Uh, so in the process of making the movie, Raya and the Last Dragon, the production crew and the film, filmmakers, they went to uh, Southeast Asia to do some background research. So the, so the first question will be, uh, the sec here. Let's wait for more people to come in. Wow, that's a lot of people. Nice. All right. And let's begin. The first question is, where did the production team of Raya and the Last Dragon did not go to to do background research on? And the choices are Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, Philippines. So yeah, let's see what you guys answered. And uh, all right, you guys guessed Cambodia, but unfortunately that is not the answer. The correct answer is Malaysia. So yeah, they, the production team did not go to Malaysia to do background research on. They, did, uh, they mostly took inspiration from the Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, but Malaysia was unfortunately not one of them. So yeah, all right, let's go to the next question. Now, the second question is more related to uh, the Korean cinema uh, scene. So if you if you've kept up with the Oscars, the Academy Awards. So last year, uh, Bong Joon Ho won won uh, an Oscar, and he was the first Korean director to win an Oscar. Which movie did he direct and was given an award for? And the choices are Snowpiercer, Memories of Murder, Parasite, The Call, and The Gangster, The Cop, and The Devil. So which is the answer? Let's guess. Let's see what you answered. Well done, 45 of you answered Parasite, and that is the correct answer. Nice job. Nice. All right. So he did, he did win uh, an Oscar for Best Director, and Parasite did win an Oscar for Best Picture. So yeah. And also, yet another question. Uh, if you've kept up with the newest, the 93rd, 93rd Academy Awards, which happened to be last week, um, there, there was a... South Korean actress who won uh, an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. And the third question is, who is she? What's her name? So let's see, let's see what, let's see the options. And she won an award for her role in Minari, which is one of the newest movie that came out this year. And the choices are Song Hye Kyo, Kim Tae Hee, Yoon Yo Jung, Son Ye Jin, and Cho Yo Jung. So let's see which one you answered. And that's right, Yoon Yoo Jung was the winner of the uh, award for Best Supporting Actress for a role in Minari. And yeah, congrats to her. And she was the first South Korean actress to won the award. So well done, 28 of you got the answer correct. Now let's see the leaderboards and who guessed all the answers correct. All right, let's see here. And it seems to be Ethan, well done. Ethan seems to be the one who answered the questions fastest, the fastest and the most precise. Well done to Ethan. All right. Well, that is the end of our um, ice breaking questions. So 
thank you for participating and hope everyone had fun learning more about ASEAN and the Republic of Korea. So before we officially start this webinar and to ensure that everyone has a good experience, uh, there are some house rules that I would like to share with you. First of all, uh, please rename yourself in the Zoom application according to your affiliation and your name. For example, it's your name and where you come from, your, uh, what organiza organization you're from. And for the sec second one, for the attendees, we encourage you to ask questions to our panelists. So please write them in the questions and answers box. You can just click the Q&A box in the webinar controls to launch it, and you can upvote the question in the Q&A. But since you cannot comment, I will collate your questions and relay it to the moderator. The third one, as this webinar is chat-based, your microphones are automatically muted and your videos are turned off. And the last one, if for those who are seeking a certificate, Please stay with us until the very end of this webinar, and I will let you know the easy way to get it. So now, yeah, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the first webinar of Connect ASEAN Cultural Diplomacy Forum. And we'll now begin with the main event that will be moderated by Mr. Ben Ham, the project director of Connect ASEAN. Please join me in welcome moderator, Mr. Ben Ham. Thank you, Johnny, and uh, well done uh, with the pronunciation of the Korean names and the Menti games. <laughs> uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today, um, especially uh, to those young people across ASEAN universities and government agencies. Uh, welcome. Uh, now, last year during the height of the pandemic, we conducted a series of webinars titled the Connect ASEAN Creative Futures Dialogue. It was an effort to explore the future of creative work for arts practitioners in Southeast Asia and Korea. Our webinar focused on three themes, digital acceleration, social impact, and environmental sustainability. The initiative was devised not only to offer practical advice and explore policy recommendations and areas for intergovernmental coordination, but to inspire and support the next generation of creatives. Nothing engenders a sense of solidarity more than discussion amongst our peers and imagining possibilities for what the future may hold. Today, I am very pleased to announce the launch of our next webinar series, the Cultural Diplomacy Forum, a chance for the ASEAN Foundation's core audience of young people to learn about the importance of culture in imagining our world's futures. The work of artists connects us in tangible and dynamic ways to the world, advances diplomatic efforts, deep connections between peoples, mutual understanding and goodwill that in turn builds the resilient communities underpinning our future prosperity. Cultural activities will play a pivotal role in our region in countering the negative consequences of isolation caused by COVID-19. We are especially grateful to the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund for supporting the ASEAN Foundation to host this webinar series and many other arts and cultural programs via the Connect ASEAN program. To begin the forum, we will look at ASEAN's approach to cultural diplomacy with particularly close attention paid to its exhibition histories in the period between the 80s and 90s when the ASEAN Cultural Fund played an integral role in the cultivation of an ASEAN regional identity. We will also look into the idea of the artist as diplomat through the career of Indonesian painter, Basuki Abdullah. We highlight as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the ASEAN Gallery. The gallery located in the ASEAN Secretariat building in Jakarta holds a collection of diplomatic gifts and is a display of regional solidarity through objects. Now, it is my very great honor to introduce Mr. Lee Jung Jung, our keynote speaker. Pak Jung Jung has distinguished career in international relations, public policy, and economic development, and has edited the book, ASEAN Matters, reflecting on the association of South
my apology. Uh, I think there has been a technical mistake on uh, Ben's connection, on our moderator's connection. Now we already got Ben. Hello, can can anyone see me? Yes, we can hear you, Ben. Can you see me as well? Yes, we can see you, Ben. Okay, I'm terribly sorry. It seems my uh, Wi-Fi has uh, has dropped out, but I believe I was in the middle of introducing uh, Pak Yong Yong. Um, so we'll just pick up from there. Uh, Pak, uh, so Pak Yong Yong, he edited the book uh, ASEAN Matters, reflecting on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, he has had a distinguished career in international relations, public policy, and economic development. And as the director of community relations at ASEAN, uh, uh, he um, oversees the ASEAN Gallery and the ASEAN Collection. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the screen Pak Yong Yong. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the very generous uh, introduction. I thought I'd lost you for a while as well. Uh, very, you know. Very, very glad to see all these young people coming together uh, as we talk about this series of webinar to introduce more about what you know, uh, cultural diplomacy. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure whether am I so qualified enough to give a keynote, but as what Ben has mentioned, uh, the ASEAN Gallery is indeed part of the feature of the ASEAN Secretariat. And in that sense, allow me, you know, uh, as part of my job, allow me to just give some statements about what, uh, what the gallery is. And for those who have not visited the gallery before or the ASEAN Secretariat for the matters, please do consider coming after, you know, when, when all restriction and protocols are uplifted. We would definitely welcome you to, you know, to, 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 to share with you what the gallery is. In any way, I, I wanted to thank the ASEAN Foundation, uh, on behalf of the Secretariat. I want to thank the Foundation, ASEAN Foundation, as well as the Republic of Korea uh, for this partnership. Uh, we are extremely pleased to embark on this first of these three webinars to explore cultural diplomacy in ASEAN uh, in the lead up to the 54th ASEAN Day on 8th of August this year. Uh, as you know, this year, besides celebrating our 54th anniversary, uh, Ben has also mentioned that, you know, we have the ASEAN Gallery, which incidentally is celebrating the 20th anniversary as well, uh, the ASEAN Gallery. So, all in all, it is a very auspicious year. Uh, the ASEAN Gallery actually today house the ASEAN Collection, uh, comprises of paintings, sculptures, among others, that has been gifted to ASEAN in the past 40 years. And from the way we, you know, when we look at all these gifts, whether it is from the member states or it is from the ASEAN dialogue partners, each of these diplomatic gifts do provide what we call a visual narrative of human civilization's effort to pay a tribute to the institutions that ensure the integrity of history, such as trade routes, uh, political alliances, as well as uh, social uh, customs. Uh, this is why I guess when the 10th Secretary General of ASEAN, uh, the late Ambassador Rod Rodolfo Severino Jr. of the Philippines, during his term as the Sec Gen of ASEAN, he thought it would be a good idea to set aside an area within the increasingly space-constrained ASEAN Secretariat building to display all these arts contribution and donation from partners. As I mentioned, this came from not just the government, not just the ASEAN member states themselves, but also from the ASEAN dialogue partners. There's also some from the private donors, uh, business communities. So the spirit all in all is to illustrate the strategic uh, cooperation uh, and partnership that ASEAN has shared with these stakeholders. And as of today, uh, the ASEAN Gallery actually is hosting 104 collections, which consists of 76 paintings, eight sculptures, 20 art objects, with a total value about valuation of about 1.65 million. 
So actually, it's, it's, it's quite a sizable collection. I really do welcome you to drop in after the COVID protocol has been lifted. And ever since I took over this function of running the ASEAN Gallery, uh, we have planned it to make it a hub or part of an eco or art ecosystem, we call it, in the ASEAN region to draw arts lover uh, together or on board. Uh, we, uh, we are operating on a shoestring budget uh, uh, and that's why we are very glad, you know, where we have our sister agency support, like ASEAN Foundation, and together we try to pack it, you know, this ASEAN Gallery to a bigger platform, bigger stage, like the Jakarta Art Fair, where visitors to Jakarta, you know, upon visiting the this internationally acclaimed art event in Jakarta, they would also drop by or drop in to visit the secretary. We are based in Jakarta, so, you know, it's like a... By the way, they come and visit ASEC, spend an hour or so in the gallery, look at our collection. And this is exactly what we did in the last few years. Uh, we celebrated our Golden Jubilee on the 8th of August 2017. And I think with uh, Ben's help, we also staged what we call the inaugural curated exhibition, Assemblage, Reflection on ASEAN. You can uh, Google about it. Uh, in 2019, just two years ago, when we had our new building ready, we hosted an exhibition called The Shifting Ties uh, that is organized in a new gallery. So these are all major milestones in the evolving function of this thing called the ASEAN Gallery uh, that we hope to bring arts, cultural community in the region together. Uh, in the same year last year, we also launched the ASEAN Red ASEAN Artist Residency Program, which has seen become one of our annual flagship activities. So these activities uh, identify young, hungry, emerging artist talent from Southeast Asia to take part in a four-week residency in Jakarta and to produce an artwork in the Secretariat building. And so far, AARP has supported two artists, one each from Thailand, and the other is from Vietnam. Uh, the work, the completed work from Thai, the Thai artist is now currently being showcased in the gallery. Uh, we hope that through AARP, we can continue to touch outreach, do more outreach and in, uh, realize touch base with more young artists in the years to come. So that is the gallery, you know, will be uh, playing the role of an uh, enhanced collaborator role to support the vision and shrine in the ASEAN community journey. Uh, my personal vision is besides making the ASEAN gallery as a stage for the young artists to blossom, I wanted to further utilize the gallery as an avenue to provide the narration and perspective of curators, art historians, as well as our own ASEAN secretary staff members uh, to share and to unfold the many dimensions of cultural diplomacy in modern day ASEAN history. So with that, I end my keynote. I hope that this, you know, I trust that this, this webinar will be, uh, you know, a very successful one and you'll be the first of the many to come so that we can all appreciate the diversity of ASEAN nations and the rich arts and cultural heritage that this region brings together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Park Yong Yong. And uh, if you could just stay with us for a few moments, we're going to take uh, a picture uh, of, of you and the rest of the panelists uh, for our social media. And of course, with our executive director, uh, Dr. Yang, uh, who is joining us from Malaysia. Hello, Dr. Yang. <laughs> and uh, yes, Hello, I'm now sitting right next to my router. <laughs> So yes, this is the reality of digital diplomacy. Uh, yes, I'm very, very sorry about the uh, technical difficulties, but I'm sitting right next to my router now, so we shouldn't have any uh, further mishaps. <laughs> um, so Johnny, will you let us know when the photo session is concluded? Uh, yes. Or, or, uh, or what you would like us to do? Uh, I think it's according to Amy. Is Amy here? Yes. Uh, yeah, I will count to uh, three, okay? When it's three, uh, post your best smile, okay? Three, two, one.
wait a minute, please. Um, one more. Uh, perhaps with a Korean heart like this. Okay. Okay. Korean heart. Here we go. Two, <laughs> one. I will do. I will do the bigger heart. All right. Okay. <laughs> Two, one. Great, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you, Amy, and, and uh, thank you, Dr. Yang, and thank you, Pak Yong Yong, uh, for joining us. We won't keep you any longer. Uh, we shall now uh, move on to our panelists. So uh, let's uh, let's go to our first panelist. Uh, um, so uh, we're going to go to Carlos. Uh, so Carlos Quajon Jr., um, who is based in Manila, uh, is a, a curator, uh, art critic, and writer. Um, uh, I mean, uh, from uh, you know, amongst his many writing credits, he's, uh, he has been a research resident at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul, Korea, and a fellow of the Trans Curatorial Academy in Berlin and Mumbai. Uh, he's curated projects in Hong Kong, Seoul, and Manila, and most recently, he co-curated, along with Kathleen Ditzig, who is also with us today, the exhibition In Our Best Interests, Afro-Southeast Asia Affinities During a Cold War, uh, which was in Singapore. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Carlos to the screen. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. First, thank you to Connect the SEAN, the SEAN Foundation, for um, organizing this panel. Um, so I'll be presenting um, my paper um, titled Generative Consequences, Latitude of Southeast Asian Modern in ASEAN Exhibition History, um, which is part of a longer paper. Um, and for this, I thank um, the help of TK Sabapati um, and the Kalo Ledesma Foundation Incorporated for the research with, which transpired during the pandemic. So throughout his engagements with Southeast Asian history, TK Sabapathy has persistently foregrounded the salience of writing and exhibition making in staking a regionalist perspective. Next slide, please. In a 1982 essay on the premises of studying modern art in Southeast Asia, Framed by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, Sabapathy remarked that, and I quote, the expectation has been that ASEAN exhibitions are institutional endeavors seeking to provide overviews of varied and shared conceptions, shaping modern art practices in the countries of the region. End quote. These varied and shared conceptions are elaborated by, an, by way of an artwork's revealed aesthetic qualities as well as its marking of a moment of generative consequence, around which perceptions and contexts regarding importance and influences can be suggested. However, Sabapathy argues that while earlier mobile exhibitions were potentially productive in prospecting the stakes of art making and exhibition making in Southeast Asia, they have largely failed to fully flesh out the implications of regional orientations. This presentation elaborates on these aspects and posits intricate interfacings between practitioners, institutions, artworks, and exhibition as marking a moment of generative consequence by way of looking at the development of articulations of modern art in Southeast Asia that emerges out of and, and cultivated in the exhibitionary form from the 1980s to the 1990s. Particularly, this essay considers how the ASEAN, through the institutional platform of the ASEAN Workshop, Exhibition, and Symposium on Aesthetics, or WISA, next slide, please, allowed actors, teachers, art historians, critics, curators, usually hyphenated or hybridized across the then consolidating region to convene and think about modernity and modernism in Southeast Asia. It looks at three practitioners active during the period and who participated in the WISA. Sabapathy, who I quoted earlier, born 1938 in Singapore. Alice Guillermo, um, born 1938 in Manila. Uh, and uh, Rod Perez Perez, 1934 in Manila. These figures became prominent in annotating and parsing modern art histories in Southeast Asia 
as these were belatedly accounted for in exhibition in the 1990s. The SAN becomes an extraordinarily productive cipher in this inquiry since it is embedded in the political demands of diplomacy in as much as it has, specifically during this period, allowed and enabled practitioners and interlocutors to stake their claims on the pragmatic inflections of regionalist perspectives. Framing the exhibitionary as a site of what Sabapathy mentions, generative consequence, allows us to imagine the exhibitionary form in its most extensive of terms, encompassing not only exhibition making, the making public of art or the formation of its publics, but also aesthetics, pedagogy and discourse, and history and criticism. In considering this, WISA could be seen as an exceptional iteration of the traveling regional exhibitions organized by ASEAN, distinguished from earlier single-site ASEAN exhibitions, um, for example, in Jakarta in 1968 and in Singapore in 1972. WISA also presents key differences from the first traveling platform ASEAN mobile exhibition, as you can see in our screens, or the first itinerant ASEAN exhibition of fine art and photography in 1973-1974, which showcased works by artists from and traveled to Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. This exhibition history is explored in relation to the subsequent exhibition, 36 Ideas from Asia, Contemporary Southeast Asian Art, held in Singapore in 2003. It is one of the last seminal exhibitions about art in the region that came out of the ASEAN Committee on Culture and Information, or COSI. COSI was established in 78 and also supported WISA. WISA was the product of two proposals to the COSI. The first was from Malaysia to consolidate an ASEAN art collection, while the second was from Thailand to organize a forum on aesthetics and workshop on ASEAN visual arts. It had three editions. Uh, first was in Malaysia in 1989. Next slide, please. With the theme, uh, tradition source of inspiration. Uh, the second one is in, was in the Philippines in 1993 with the theme towards the shaping of ASEAN visual arts. And finally in Singapore in 1995 with the theme, ASEAN art studies, bridging art history, aesthetics and art infrastructure. While both the WISA and the mobile exhibition, which we have seen earlier, were traveling exhibitions, there are some important distinctions between them. First and most important, while the latter was a purely exhibitionary endeavor, WISA organized workshops and symposia alongside its exhibition component. Second, while both platforms were under the auspices of ASEAN, the mobile exhibition was organized by the ASEAN National Secretariat of Malaysia while WISA was convened by the COSI, as I mentioned earlier, which was framed as a regional committee. Third, the artworks in the exhibition itself for the mobile exhibition were annotated by each country through their respective culture ministries, while WISA convened art practitioners to write and think about national art histories in relation to the region. The recognition of specialized positions from which to historicize regional artistic practice and discourse is prominent in WISA. The purely diplomatic purposes ascribed to earlier exhibitionary attempts are interrupted by the interlocution of what can be considered a discrete, discrete but nonetheless heteronomous field or logic of practice of writing and thinking about art in the region. Fourth, where the mobile exhibition presented existing works, WISA commissioned art works that emphasized a formative and mediative articulation of both regional identity and its modernity. The structure of WISA is instructive in this sense. A workshop on visual arts practice prompted artists to respond with new works that would form the ASEAN art collection for each country, while the delegates' earlier works were showcased in a separate exhibition. Parallel to this, a symposium discussing the state of local art ecologies parsed the period. The structure ensured that practice became dynamic and interventive in the mapping of the region's social milieu and creative life. The trajectories of the practice of Guillermo, 
sa Bapathy and Prosperous post-visa perhaps fulfill the platform's generative consequence, particularly in relation to the history of modern art in the region as this cultivated regional implications. As agents who attended WISA, they crafted itineraries that developed in the context of the workshops and symposia. Guillermo and Sabapati on their framings of modern art history and Parasperes and the institutionalization of regional art historical scholarship by way of the ASEAN Art Institute, which he founded. Guillermo, a delegate to the first and second visa, next slide please, co-curated the exhibition Asian Modernism, Diverse Developments, which was organized as the inaugural project of the Japan Foundation Asia Center after it's, it changed its identity from the Japan Foundation ASEAN Center in 1995. The exhibition traveled from Tokyo in 1995 to Manila, then Bangkok, and then to Jakarta in 1996. Sabapathy, who curated Modernity and Beyond, the inaugural exhibition of the Singapore Art Museum in 96, took part in all three editions of WISA. And lastly, Paras Perez, representative in the third WISA, wrote for the exhibition, The Birth of Modern Art in Southeast Asia in 1997 for the Fukuoka Art Museum, which traveled to four museums across Japan. All three, are seminal exhibitions on modern art in Southeast Asia as the discourse of modernity in and of the region flourished in the 1990s. This regional imagination is astutely articulated in the writings of Sabafati and Guillermo. Next slide. In 1993, <clears throat> welcoming the participants of the second visa in Manila, Guillermo discussed the ongoing lively development of discourses on regional aesthetics. She proclaimed that constituting ourselves as active, self-determining subjects, the region can confidently assert its itself in its art and aesthetics that are being built on its own terms, exigencies, historical and material conditions, end of quote. For Guillermo, crucial in this latitude is an appreciation of how, and I quote, the modernist enterprise in our cultures has not been entirely negative, end of quote. She explained, Decades in modernism's introduction, a process of appropriation and indigenization has taken place, resulting in the acquisition of a visual and artistic vocabulary with its powerful potential and highly sensitive capability for conveying a wide variety of human, individual, and collective contemporary experiences and ideological contents. Sabapathy's earlier propositions resonate with such an observation and talks about an analogous logic of acculturation in relation to what he describes as the dependence of critical and art historical practices that are heavily indebted to receive traditions, conceptions, and values institutionalized in the USA and in Europe. Guillermo's, and I quote, process of appropriation and indigenization and quote, may be seen as parallel to Sabapathy's elaboration of a comparable agency of what he terms revision and domestication, in such a way that these considerations, quote, need to be controlled and inclined toward positions that suggest and clarify contexts for modern art activity in Southeast Asia. Where conventional accounts of this history consider modern art an alien formation against indigenous modalities of making and creating, Guillermo and Sabapati emphasize how it is transformed and translated in the context of Southeast Asia. This articulation of what the Southeast Asian modern involves and what urgencies motivate its translation in the region might best be understood as a geopoetic imagination, where place shapes how concepts gain traction and how concepts transform how place or region is imagined. What Sabapati and Guillermo allude to in these reformulations is how the history of modernism may well be mediated by the, by the modernity of the regional formation itself, which is Southeast Asia, that ASEAN represents in the cultivation and continu continuity of which it facilitates. In considering the tenor of regionality, we self-grounds the importance of an itinerant articulation and discursively 
multifaceted processes such as the workshop, the symposium, and the exhibition to compose a region. With each iteration of insight for the WISA, a particular vantage point frames what is imagined about regional aesthetics or art in the region. The exhibitionary format is rendered more robust by the complementary activities of workshops and symposia, while the coordinates of the region are continually interrogated and its latitude insistently prospected. Within this framework, we can glean the compelling reconsiderations of the regional and the exhibitionary in the trajectory of modern art that problematizes its strictly Western conceptualization. Next slide. By focusing on the generative consequences of region in the exhibitionary too, we complicate the historicization of efforts to map out and curate art in the region by other global powers, such as Japan in the 1980s and 1990s, with efforts by the Japan Foundation Asia Center and the Fukuoka Art Museum. While Thai curator and art historian Apinan Pashananda situate these efforts in the context of new relations of coloniality, or for him, within relationships of, and I quote, a post-hegemonic world, end of quote, that takes shape after the bipolar rhetoric of the Cold War, looking at how practitioners, such as Abapati, Guillermo, and Perez and how their practices insist on the vitality of regionally attuned imaginations that frustrate narratives which simplify their participation as merely compromised. While various formations and institutions, such as ASEAN, Japan and Asia Center, etc., had their own diplomatic and political agenda in terms of infrastructure development, agents were not merely instrumentalized by the infrastructures that they found themselves enabled within or by. They were intelligent and articulate about their positionalities without also being too naive about their subjective exceptionality vis-a-vis -vis these acts of colonial or geopolitical largesse. Dispensations of regionality, because they situate modernity and modernism in prolific contexts and sites, point us to more sympathetic urgencies with which to reconsider the art history of modernism. These render imaginations of modernity and modernism premised on regionality, keen on refusing both the com complete foreclosure of a local geopoetic agency and intelligence. At the same time, these also refuse the total disavowal of neo slash neo-colonial entanglements and how they substantially alter the Southeast Asian life world. Writing for the exhibition 36 Ideas from Asia in 2002, Sabapathy looked back at the history of regional exhibitions organized by the ASEAN and how even with this history, comparative premises have not taken root. More than 50 years since the formation of ASEAN and almost 40 years since Sabapati bemoaned the diplomatic priorities of ASEAN exhibitions, it is perhaps time to reconsider not only how we think about the grammar of the exhibitionary, but also how we think about regionality in terms of their generative consequences. Next slide. WISA is exceptional in this sense with its emphasis on the poetic and contingent nature of imagining the constitution of the region through its simultaneous focus on the exhibition and its traveling in multi-site iteration and related activities such as organizing of workshops and symposia and commissioning of artworks. The trajectories of the practices of Sabapathy, Guillermo and Perez Perez post-WISA and how they became important interlocutors in the ways in which the history of modern art in the region is addressed, engaged with, or thought about by interregional and extra-regional institutions mark the capacity of the exhibitionary to motivate generative consequences of thinking regionally. Seen this way, thinking about generative consequences asks us to be keen on how the exhibitionary framework in its most generous sense in itself is generative of configurations of region and consequently how the prolific coordinates of regionality should shape the materiality of the exhibitionary. Uh, thank you. That's all from me. Thank you very much, Carlos, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, we shall now move on to our next speaker, uh, Kathleen Ditzig. Uh, she is a curator and researcher based in Singapore, 
Uh, she recently curated As the West Slept at the World Trade Center in New York as part of Performer 2019 and was assistant curator to Uta Mehta Bauer for the exhibition Spring of Democracy, uh, commissioned by the Gwangju Biennale Foundation in 2020. Her work unpacks the enduring legacies of the Cold War and examines art as an exceptional site and system of speaking to power. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen to the screen. Thanks, Ben, for that introduction. Um, without further ado, I'm, and, and thank you for having me in this panel. Um, without further ado, I'm just going to jump straight into the presentation. Um, this expands some of the ideas that Carlos um, so eloquently and beautifully put forward already in his examination of the different ASEAN um, exhibitions and projects, but this takes us a little bit back. Um, so this presentation is an abstraction of the larger research project and a provocation to expand the way we think about cultural diplomacy and its actors, suggesting that an Indonesian artist, Basuki Abdullah's gift giving and circulation between Southeast Asian, um, Southeast Asia, Asian nations before the formal formulation of the Regional Association of ASEAN um, and also after can be considered cultural diplomacy and therefore that diplomacy can be thought of beyond uh, nation state actors and, and should be considered across an expanded timeline so beyond the instance of the one gift and to think in the rever reverberations of history. Um, in this presentation, I'll focus primarily on two paintings that the Indonesian artists gave to Singapore. The first one is this one, um, Building of the New World, um, which are, towards the end I'll tell you has a very interesting multiple stories to it, but one story of it was that it was gifted in 1959 to the City Council of Singapore. The second one is this one, the second, um, which is the struggle for the reestablishment of the democracy and the right for the people um, which was gifted um, to the National Museum of Singapore in 1981. However, where I want to start uh, to an extent is after a period in time in which these paintings have really faded into memory rather than in the moments themselves. So in 1989, the Straits Times reported that Ho Kak Leong, then Parliamentary Secretary of Communications and Information, assisted the Indonesian artist Basuki Abdullah in tracking down building the new world. Basuki Abdullah had sought to compile a monograph of his works and reached out to a Singaporean associated, a businessman for help and thus was connected to the, this parliamentary secretary. The newspapers at the time reported that the painting depicted what Basuki Abdullah thought of modern Singapore and was donated by the artist to the former city council. So um, Basuki Abdullah flew to Singapore on a Wednesday, saw the painting on a Thursday and by Friday left Singapore. This short trip and personal tie um, becomes a diplomatic representation, unfortunately in this poorly um, represented image from the newspaper archives, which you see here where the artist, the businessman, his friend, and the parliamentary secretary, as well as the then Indonesian ambassador to Singapore is pictured viewing the painting. So this is where a story where in the artist's search for this gift that he once gave in 1959 creates this composite image or diplomatic image where you have diplomatic cultural cultural diplomats actually in, in interacting to, to find this painting, right? So this is the first moment it, it presents itself through, through the newspaper and the public consensus. But there's a second moment and I want to go back now to the actual 1959 when he gave when he supposedly gave it to the city council. So in 1959 Basuki Abdullah was reported to be living in Singapore and had been for the years around that between we don't know for sure but we think it I think it's 1957-98 and during this time he traveled around the, the region. So in 1959 he gives the painting to a to a to the city council of Singapore which was dissolved in that same year because that was the year that Singapore gained self-governance. Um, it is probable from this timeline that he gifted it on the occasion or around the time of the Singapore Constitution exhibition, an exhi exhibition that ran from January to February 1959. It was organized by the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Um, the participants included all government departments, industries, and companies like IBM, um, you know, Coca-Cola. The participants um, 
and, and in, in this array, the city council was a key player. So as this postcard um, illustrating that um, promoting this event sort of points to, it was the biggest Southeast Asian trade exposition celebrating Singapore's self-governance as much as it celebrated the riches and heritage of Southeast Asia as a civilizational crossroad. Now, this is interesting when we think back to what the painting looked like. Now, what was Basuki Abdullah doing and how was he part of this, right? Um, so it's, it's also important to note that by, um, but at this point, he um, he was he participated in two ways. First of all, he um, he got to um, sketch and represent one of the VIP um, visitors to the present um, to to the exposition, which was then Prince Philip. And he also participated as um, a judge on its key beauty pageant, the Pearl of the Orient, choosing. Um, one of um, choosing um, choosing a woman, so he sort of participated also in this national um, na national but also regionally imagined exposition. Um, but it's important to know this: by the time of the expo exposition, Basuki Abdullah was already a, a regionally acclaimed artist who was building uh, networks between Southeast Asian nations and other nations beyond the region. He was also regionally popular. So by the time we have this exhibition in 1958, he was so popular that in Singapore, 6,000 people visited his exhibition. Um, so when we think back about this gift, and he says that it was an imagination of the future, it's very probable that the painting was also informed by his time and his work with the trade fair and the exposition. Okay, the other thing is when we think about his participation that we also have to think about what he was doing in Singapore. So even as early as 1959, sorry, 1955, it was reported that he had already tra and traveling to the region had wanted to make portraits of important individuals. And it was reported that he had deliberately sketched David Marshall, Singapore's chief minister from 1955 to 56. And this was because of his popularity when, um, David Marshall traveled to Indonesia. And so when Basuki Abdullah was in Singapore, he, he requested to um, sketch him and he did. Um, and once he sketched him, he actually took that sketch and he says this and it's reported in the newspaper that he intended to display the portrait in his touring exhibition through Europe in 1955. This is interesting because this seems to be a strategy that happens. And this is another one that's very famously reported at one of his most prominent exhibitions of his works, which took place in Tokyo in 1959. Um, he presents his work, so he's living in Singapore. But this is pretty much like right after the exposition. He goes off to Tokyo. Um, he puts on this exhibition and President Sukarno, the Indonesian president at that time, visits him. President Sukarno buys two paintings, but in the process, um, Basuki Abdullah decides to gift him a painting and he gives him, um, sorry, not a painting, a sketch, a pastel portrait. And so he get, unfortunately, we don't, we don't know what this image looks like. So what, what I've provided here is actually a photograph of um, Miss Singapore or Miss Singapore, the Miss, the Singapore contendant for Miss Universe, Marion Willis, which was what this pastel portrait was of. So what we can see evidenced in this from the David Marshall to the Marion Willis, um, to even his gifting of this imagination of the future of Singapore after this major event, right? Or in relation to this major event is that Basuki Abdullah obviously mobilized his artworks um, towards some kind of symbolic, not so much symbolic exchange, but he mobilized his artworks um, between political figures and, and to promote sort of political figures in that sense. And, and he, in and through this act of mobilization that no one told him to do, but he did of his own, we see as kind of symbolic exchange between nation states. Um, it's important to note also that uh, by the 1960s, he would become the official court painter for Thailand and that throughout um, his career, he would paint the portraits of many Southeast Asian leaders and sort of take on uh, national portraitures like this one with for the Marcoses, which was also from the 60s. Um, so in a sense, Basuki Abdullah's paintings were part of, a, were part of an emergent a regional and national language of representation. Now I want to move on to quickly 1981. Now this is where things get a little interesting, or uh, more interesting, especially when we start to talk comparatively. So in 1981, um, Basuki Abdullah returns to Singapore. 
He presents an exhibition of his paintings and drawings at the Hilton Hotel. This is organized by Is Isetan or Orchards. We're actually talking about a mall in that sense or a shopping, um, um, a shopping organization, right? A shopping mall. And, um, and it's their anniversary and the exhibition is sort of uh, presented as part of one of their things that they organize. During, during this time, he presents these paint he presents paintings, but he also takes the time to make sketches. And one of the one of the sort of famous sketches he makes at the, this time is of Lee Kuan Yew. So in making this drawing, he takes a number of press interviews, and this is when he's when some of his, um, he starts to explain some of these portraits that he's been making. Um, and he says that artist communication, presenting the character of these leaders on canvas and showing them to the people, helps bring people closer to their leaders. Now, the other thing that happens, other than he, he makes these sketches on the occasion of this exhibition in 1981, is he would actually donate this, this painting, um, the struggle for the reestablishment of democracy and the rights of people. So the painting, which you see here in, from the newspaper, but also here in detail, pictures an underwater scene of a mermaid with flowing, uh, flowing hair among coral and fish, um, like, like the building of the new world. It is a fantastic painting. Of, of political indeterminacy. So you don't, pre it has this very politically loaded title, but we don't necessarily see this in the representation itself, right? In, in the painting itself, one would have to almost read into it, right? Um, and so there are not exactly explicit um, political references here. So if we are to consider this painting and we're to consider the one before that I mentioned, um, as well as the portraits of the beauty queens and political fi um, figures that he gifted and circulated, Basuki Abdullah created paintings that appealed to a wide base in which he envisioned as connecting people. His paintings were therefore, in a sense, effective tools of diplomacy because they were so much part of the mainstream, as much as they, they circumvented some of the traditional um, circuits of diplomacy, that, he, that his informal relationship with some of these people, that he would um, enable certain types of symbolic exchanges, so the giving of a beauty queen's a uh, portrait to the president of Indonesia is possible because of a personal relationship that functions outside of specific diplomatic ties, but then takes on other significance, right? But it's also, um, so, but it is this malleability and indeterminacy um, that, that at the same time we can read into, that can read specifically yet vaguely and broadly um, about a Southeast Asian regionalism or a Southeast Asian milieu, that we can really start to think about what Southeast Asian cultural diplomacy can mean or could. Um, it is on the one hand, a cultural diplomacy not necessarily tied to the, to the diplomat and one that the artist has agency to undertake himself and which is open enough to be ascribed with multiple meanings and therefore is fundamentally inclusive. The statement, I mean this, not as a platitude, and this is especially important when we, I want to take, come back to this painting, The Building of the New World, and what I have presented here, which is snapshots from Reddit. So, Building of the New World is a diplomatic gift in some senses that keeps giving. A year ago, in the middle of Singapore's circuit breaker, a Reddit group emerged asking about this painting. The painting, um, the painting had long since been returned to its owner, so um, which is uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, and was no longer on display. Yet in the middle of a bleak lockdown, an informal community haunted by the memory of seeing this previously in the National Gallery of Singapore, wondered about its meaning. As you can see here, some claimed that it was dystopic, while others claimed it was a shining example of a post-colonial future. In this regard, there is another narrative I need to tell you about. So when NGS first showed this painting in 2016, it noted that it was an image of the third world and was a gift between Adam Malik and Raja Ratnam. It is possible that there were two very identical or close to similar paintings in City Hall before NGS presented them in the Singapore DBS gallery. Um, very possibly the parallel narr narratives of the paintings being both a diplomatic gift between two of the founding fathers of ASEAN, as well as personal gifts by the artists um, are important to keep in mind and can coexist um, and are productive if we think about them as coexisting because it then becomes productive to also think about an expanded understanding of how these artworks can perform dip diplomatically and how they can circumvene through different spaces. So clearly, 
by considering these paintings that the artist gifted, we realized that there was a political and cultural diplomatic nuance to Basuki Abdullah's circulation and production as an artist, whether this was deliberate or not, such that we could think and ask how effective is the artist as a cultural di diplomat and that he defined national and regional language of state portraiture in a number of states and was able to navigate between different net networks. Furthermore, if we are to think of the artist as cultural diplomat in an expanded sense, what do these paintings that speak on multiple levels and with a certain inde indeterminacy tell us about the evolving and enduring project of cultural diplomacy? Moreover, 50 years on, these paintings are still performing diplomatically, building ties, imaginaries of joint futures, hounding the anonymous masses of Reddit and speaking to our contemporary geopolitical imaginations of our histories as they expand into future third or third, third or alternative worlds. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to note that this research has really been enabled by a number of people, or Wardani, Roger Nelson, as well as a number of institutions and um, key secondary source literature that can be found um, online that ha has been shared uh, publicly. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for that wonderful and engaging presentation. Um, uh, we are now going to go on to our last uh, panelist, uh, Seng Yu Jin, who is the senior curator at the National Gallery Singapore and currently lectures in the minor in art history at the National University in Singapore. Uh, he was most recently part of a transnational collaborative project co-curated by three national museums, the Museum of Modern Art Tokyo, uh, Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Korea, and the National Gallery Singapore, which resulted in the touring exhibition, Awakenings, Art in Society in Asia, 1960s to 1990s. Please join me in welcoming Eugene to the screen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dan, um, and and I, I'm just you know listen to to both um, Carlos and Kathleen. I mean, um, very fascinating um, presentations, and in and in many ways, I am I am actually picking up from where Carlos left off uh, by looking at um, the history of ASEAN exhibitions at the at the turn of the millennium. Um, so I think that's nice um, a way and a good way in which maybe we can have a conversation um, later on um, as well. All right, so, so the title of my presentation today is um, Charting Southeast Asia on its own terms, um, a history of ASEAN art exhibitions at the turn of the millennium. Um, next slide, please. Um, exhibitions um, seek to strengthen and, and consolidate um, regional networks, affiliations, and relationships um, through art, and, and also offers the possibility of constructing different cartographical narratives of Southeast Asia, of which um, ethnicity, the nation state, and the region are arguably the most frequently evoked in defining um, these cartographies. Um, from this perspective, um, the emergence of regional survey art exhibitions like the ASEAN exhibitions are similar endeavors aimed at constructing regional categories such as Southeast Asia that serve to mediate the production and exchange of knowledge um, through curatorial practices, methods, approaches, and perspectives. Often accompanying these exhibitions are symposiums, forums, workshops, and publications that provide opportunities for art curators, historians, critics, and artists to engage in a wide range of issues related to art, thus facilitating the dissemination and um, generation of art discourses that are crucial to the engendering of new approaches in the understanding and explication of contemporary art in these regions. Curators, artists, sponsors, and other stakeholders who are involved in exhibitions that promote a sense of regionness are uh, implicit cartographers who engage and negotiate in the mapping and remapping of such exhibitions. These regional survey exhibitions are highly contested sites that require extensive funding from a variety of sponsors. And, and Carlos had actually mentioned COSI uh, from ASEAN, which was an important sponsor as well, um, including state institutions, each bringing with them their own agendas and expectations jostling to be realized in the exhibitionary form. So my presentation today will trace the histories of the ASEAN exhibitions by examining two specific um, ASEAN-sponsored exhibitions, 
the first of which is the 12th um, ASEAN Artists um, Exhibition that was in 2000 and 36 ideas from Asia, contemporary Southeast Asian art in 2003, where it ends with a different curatorial model of mapping art in the region, in turn illuminating and questioning the underlying dominant assumptions, methods, and approaches um, projected by such exhibitions. Given the growing importance of regional survey exhibitions, it is therefore pertinent that we ask what kinds of maps are being constructed, uh, who are constructing them, uh, what kind of stories or narratives are the maps uh, telling and most importantly, which maps are being privileged uh, over others? Okay, um, next slide, please. So the birth of ASEAN in, in 1967 uh, paralleled a new era of cultural cooperation among its neighbours. As art historian and critic TK Sabarpathy noted, and I quote, Art exhibitions are one of the several cultural initiatives which are deemed as useful in displaying regional consciousness and diversity, unquote. So cultural activities, which includes the visual arts, was deemed to be critical in, for in forging a regional identity through ASEAN cooperation. So the ASEAN Committee on Culture and Information, so COSI, which was set up in 1978, inherited the objectives of ASEAN as an institutional endeavor to promote, and I quote, a sense of regional identity and contribute to the enrichment of the culture of um, ASEAN, unquote. So the ASEAN exhibitions were founded on the premises of um, shared historical, cultural, and even, you know, ethnological uh, links uh, of Southeast Asia as a family of nations. As a result, the, the curatorial map that was employed by the ASEAN uh, exhibitions from the 1970s, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s in particular, uh, was one that primarily served cultural diplomatic purposes and thus emphasized place contained within cultural strategies circumscribed by the nation state, you know, race and ethnicity um, until the turn of the new millennium. Um, next slide, please. I'm sorry, uh, next slide again. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, the 1997 ASEAN financial crisis demonstrated the connectedness of the various Southeast Asian economies and intensified the need for closer and faster regional cooperation under the auspices of ASEAN. With recovery afoot, the year 2000 marked the first indications of a shift in how contemporary art in Southeast Asia was going to be met for future ASEAN exhibitions. The ASEAN organized exhibition, 12 ASEAN Artists, was heralded as uh, an attempt to look beyond the superficial aspect of the association and thereby encourage a more enduring engagement. Although the 12th ASEAN Artists Exhibition remained constrained by national boundaries, as with previous ASEAN exhibitions, the self-conscious curatorial intent to choose uh, the 1950s as a cutoff point in the selection of artists indicated a desire to focus on the post-war and post-independence artists rather than those who had worked in the colonial era. This broke with the Southeast Asia's colonial past, instead emphasizing on contemporary artists such as Harry Dono and Monty and Gunma. Such a break is significant in the light of the distinctions that Jim Spanka is an art critic, uh, made different contemporary, uh, made um, uh, in terms of the uh, contemporary and modern art, whereby, uh, and I quote Jim Spanka, contemporary art, which contradicts modernist in many ways and in some ways extends it as liberated the third world art from being denied or marginalized, unquote. So 12th ASEAN artists' shift towards contemporary art therefore marked the first efforts to map Southeast Asian art and its sense of identity through the eyes of individual artists um, that offered promising ways in which the voiceless will finally be heard. Um, next slide, please. Tensions um, between the curatorial intent um, and behind the scenes sponsors on previous ASEAN exhibitions were evident in the 12th ASEAN Artists Exhibition. So Valentine Willey, the curator of the 12th ASEAN Artists Exhibition expressed his criticism of the ASEAN um, COCI, which he stated, uh, next slide please. And I quote him, ASEAN has been in existence for over 25 years. And whilst there is no doubt that it has played a vital role in enhancing regional security and stability, the grouping remains 
for most people, little more than the annual gathering of senior officials. This exhibition, 12 ASEAN Artists, is an attempt to look beyond the superficial aspects of the association and thereby encourage a more enduring engagement, uh, unquote. So Valentine Willie's statement is significant as it departs from the usual laudatory and perfunctory statements that envision and project a state of wellness and optimism towards a more comparative and critical approach to curatorial mapping, uh, to, to um, the curatorial mapping of ASEAN exhibitions. So such a move could have been prompted by the 1997 Asian financial crisis that rudely interrupted huge growth in gross domestic product of the various uh, ASEAN economy, economies leading up to 1997. So previous ASEAN exhibitions that were often celebratory and optimistic in tone were now challenged by the increasing need to face the realities of a financial crisis that revealed previously overlooked weaknesses of the affected ASEAN economies. This led to an impetus to focus on the Southeast Asia's contemporary artists who have been vocal and engaged in the rapidly changing social, economic, and political conditions they face in their communities as, exposed, as opposed um, sorry, to the usual masterpieces um, or national or rather nationalized artists um, during the colonial era. Um, next slide, please. Um, 30, 36 ideas from Asia, contemporary um, uh, Southeast Asian art, which was held as a traveling exhibition um, in 2000, from 2002 and 2003, organized by ASEAN, sought to present contemporary Southeast Asian art to audiences in Europe. Curatorially conceptualized in the late 1999, when Southeast Asia remained in the throes of political, economic, and social crisis, 36 ideas consolidated gains made by the 12 ASEAN artists' exhibition to push um, curatorial boundaries further. Even the working title of the exhibition, um, Diabok Obok, uh, encapsulates this spirit. So Kwok Kian Chow, the then director of the Singapore Art Museum, who also provided the curatorial direction of the exhibition, played a crucial role in coming up with this title, which in Javanese vernacular means, uh, or rather alludes to the stirred waters and agitated conditions in a tank, causing the fish within to be unsettled and disoriented. So it was really a metaphor to capture poignantly a sense of the tumultuous times of the dramatic events, which was the uh, Asian financial crisis, uh, in Southeast Asia in the past years of the latter millennium. So TK Sabathi also um, explained, also um, once explained uh, in, in 36 Ideas, you know, it was um, an exhibition that was a conscious curatorial effort to remap Southeast Asia artistically, and I quote, as a region to be undertaken along perspectives proposed by individual artists, unquote. Such a call to remap. Um, contemporary art in Southeast Asia proposes a possible alternative approach that treats individual artists as microcosms that engage with and are acted upon by an increasingly globalized world where the larger micro macrocosm patterns and trends can then be emerged if you explore these interactions intelligently. So unlike 12 ASEAN artists exhibition where the curatorial team and the sponsors did not see eye to eye on the direction of exhibition, 36 ideas witness a remarkable synchronization of curatorial direction. Earlier ASEAN exhibitions sponsored by COSI had, um, uh, or the COCI had uh, constructed peaceful, beautiful, and untroubled, untroubled narratives of art in Southeast Asia. 36 ideas marked a departure from this by charting a new map that sought to trace the contours of current realities facing the region simmering with tensions and discontinuities, and also to forward new approaches and methods to curating as to disrupt previous definitions of um, Southeast Asia as a category. Such a map was needed as the old map based on nation states, ethnicity, and unquestioned commonalities allowed by the decades of economic prosperity are inadequate in producing real engagements between contemporary art and the actual lived and real experiences of the people living in Southeast Asia. So in conclusion, um, mapping the, the, the histories of Southeast Asian exhibitions has revealed the limitations of the curatorial brought about by cultural dip diplomacy that yoked, to, uh, that yoked uh, the curatorial to the national, right, in the name of non-interference and an allergy to uh, criticality um, to, to maintain uh, mutual respect. From the turn of the millennium, um, ASEAN exhibitions such as the 12 ASEAN exhibitions and 36 ideas proposition alternative curatorial strategies by emphasizing on the agency of individual artists in the region who actively engage with um, current issues pertinent to them within their respective historical and cultural contexts uh, on their own terms while disrupting nationalistic discourses and territorial boundaries 
that perpetuate decentralized narratives of Southeast Asian art. So hopefully uh, these new curatorial maps, um, uh, these, sorry, hopefully uh, these uh, are new curatorial maps that uh, future ASEAN exhibitions can uh, build on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Eugene, for that wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, that now brings us to the conclusion of the first part of our webinar, which um, uh, is our presentation section. However, uh, before we go on to question time, uh, we have arranged an animated summary of our presentations by Mr. Aga Nugraha Muharam uh, from Mudi Baja. Uh, so uh, let's uh, please enjoy the animation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mas Aga. Uh, that was a great creative contribution to today's webinar. Uh, it's now time for us to take some questions. And um, we've actually had quite a lot of questions. So I'm going to paraphrase some of them so uh, we can whiz through some of them quickly. Uh, but uh, we'll go in the same uh, order as we had our presentation. So um, the first question I've combined from uh, two uh, participants today. So they're from uh, Vong Panharith from Cambodia and Nadiva Quatrina Zakra from Indonesia. Um, so I, as I said, I'm just going to paraphrase, but uh, what is the relevance of cultural diplomacy uh, to today? And is it important to contemporary artistic practice? Uh, so over to you, Carlos. I think, yeah, it's it's very important, especially at the scale and the uh, reach our um, projects, maybe exhibitions, webinars uh, like this. Um, I think it is productive for us to look into um, the potential of cultural diplomacy as a as a 
a factor in shaping our projects. Uh, so um, I think also that if we're looking into um, regional or more transnational projects, um, support from cultural diplom diplomatic associations such as Connect the Saiyan for, for once um, is vital to yeah, create something that responds to that scale and, uh, and that um, size of a, of a presentation that we want to achieve. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, over to you, uh, Kathleen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the most simple way to answer this, but I almost feel that as a curator, um, and so I'm gonna answer from the perspective of a curator rather than a research, researcher or art historian or in relation to my presentation, I think cultural diplomacy becomes actually the hard line, but also the, pro the productive moments in which new forms of imagination and, and curatorial or cultural work can be done. And I, and I mean this like literally in the sense that, um, you know, the world has been seeing before COVID or the, the discourse for the world has been for the last five years, almost a fear of deglobalization. And this has created almost a sense that the imaginations that we have for what the world is as certain countries sort of retract down and the need for, for an art regionalization, especially when you have the rise of populism in some places um, and you have, you know, increased inequality and so forth. Um, you know, these are complex issues, right? That cultural, that cultural diplomacy and cultural diplomacy working together with curators or artists from the ground can actually address in real ways. Does that answer your question directly, Ben? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we've, ra we've raised this before at the beginning <laughs> of the webinar, that cultural diplomacy is a way to imagine a world for the future. I mean, right. this has been going on uh, even from before ASEAN was established. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a good response. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, over to you, Eugene. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think uh, picking up from, from where you know, Kathleen you know, was uh, talking about deglobalization, um, and I think it's real, right? And, and um, cultural diplomacy does uh, have a role to play in that, uh, forging these networks, connections, um, um, you know, also the circulation uh, of, of, of artists and you know, art historians. You know, Carlos was really talking about it, whether it was, you know, Sabavati, you know, Guillermo, um, or Rod Perez Perez, you know, they, they are, these were, were, were art critics um, and curators who were circulating through the ASEAN um, uh, workshops, right? And, and that was how they got to know each other uh, and, and built uh, lasting uh, relationships that has resulted in uh, this, um, you know, a discourse on, on Southeast Asian art that we have today, you know, and, and one cannot deny the importance of the ASEAN uh, workshops. And, and those, those were the times without, you know, Facebook and emails, you know, and so that, that was where they met, uh, actually, and, and got to know each other and, and then, you know, in a way, found ways to collaborate with each other as well. So definitely, I would think on cultural diplomacy um, is important to this space. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely, Eugene. I think uh, you raised this very important point of which you all raised in your presentations in different ways. And that is that when people think of diplomacy, they usually think about diplomats, but really, I mean, what ASEAN has been engaged in for a very long time is artists have been diplomats, artworks have formed a diplomatic function, exhibitions also. So yeah, I, I think, it, and we continue to engage in, in these activities, of course. Um, right, okay, let's go to our second question. Um, uh, again, I'm paraphrasing two questions in the interest of time, uh, but uh, this is from <clears throat> Brian Christian Chandraputra from Indonesia and Caroline uh, Gabis from the Philippines. So uh, both of them brought up the issue of contemporary culture being mediated by technology and social media. So they would like to uh, get your thoughts on uh, promoting culture through digital diplomacy? Is it something viable and should we continue in our efforts to sustain it? Uh, over to you, Carlos. Uh, yeah, definitely I agree. Um, I think for the most part, what, what um, the digital 
environment brings to us in the contemporary moment is the proliferation of contact zones, especially, yeah, we, we, we talk about Southeast Asia, but it's really hard to create um, an interface wherein people from the region can um, encounter these kinds of projects. And I think um, the digital media is a vital um, moment in, in, this, um, in these encounters. Um, I also think that the, the digital medium has the capacity to shape how we um, experience certain things. And I think that's the, the, the digital media also. The digital medium also um, is a very important um, part of curating now or producing exhibitions now, especially in the time of COVID wherein uh, mobility is restricted. So uh, for me as a curator also, that's, and I think um, with the collaborations I had with Kathleen, this is also one, one of our um, priorities in, in that we, we look at the possibility and the potential of digital media to expand our audiences, the publics that we want to cultivate, and also to reach out to um, more people in, in this day and age. Absolutely. And, and are we not engaged directly in di digital diplomacy as we speak? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, over to you, Kathleen. Yeah, that's very meta. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, yes, I completely agree. And thank you for the question, because I think that it's an interesting one, because I, you know, um, the last slide that I presented was actually a Reddit conversation. So, you know, the digital um, space and digital technologies uh, provide new opportunities to engage. But then the question obviously becomes, how do you go about doing this? I think the second part of their question was, is it viable and should we make efforts to sustain it? Definitely, we should make efforts. Um, but the thing about um, these forms of diplomacy, and I think what becomes very interesting is what is organic perhaps, and what then becomes uh, less organic, right? And, and therefore, what is perhaps, um, you know, how do we create diplomatic safe spaces, right, online as well? Because, you know, we know the issues of online structures creating uh, closed chambers and so forth. So it's also thinking about what online di or digital diplomacy also means, like these kinds of platforms that, um, you know, like this meta moment of this conversation is a much more open form of let's say cultural digital diplomacy, right? Um, can I just add one thing? And I also, because wanna throw this at saying Eugene, but I also feel um, just to also throw it at Ben and carrying from our last question into this question about the digital is that uh, Carlos and I have spoken about this and we were thinking that, and also responding to saying um, Eugene's presentation is that there's a certain uniqueness to ASEAN diplomacy and its relationship with culture because so much of Southeast Asian art history is written through exhibitions. And so you have this interesting relationship where um, ASEAN diplomacy has created the opportunities for the sort of like professional Southeast Asian contemporary art and modern art world, right? Um, and we were thinking, are there other regional organizations in the world that have enabled that at such a scale that ASEAN has, that it's become so important in so many different countries, right? And, and Carlos and I were talking about this and we couldn't figure it out. We, we actually, the, 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 the comparison is always to make with the EU, right? As another type of regional organization and the EU doesn't have anything comparable. And so this is also something to think about, about the enduring legacy, but also importance of cultural diplomacy within the ASEAN orbit, right? And then that becomes, how does that get maintained in a new era of digital technologies, which is really where communication and meeting is more um, spread out, right? Then, then meetings that could maybe be organized in, um, in very, um, you know, defined parameters of in the 80s and 90s, right? Because it's a different age. Okay, I'm going to stop there. But I just wanted to throw that because I felt like, um, you know, saying Eugene, um, say, sorry, Eugene, not to talk to you and so formally, but um, 
your presentation really brought that to the fore for me. Well, Eugene, would you like to respond? Yeah, uh, thanks, um, uh, Kathleen. So, so it's um, yeah. So I'll I'll take the general question. I mean, the, the question first, um, uh, and then uh, I'll I'll, I'll um, yeah, I have a conversation with um, Kathleen's question. So, in terms of the digital um, diplomacy, I, I think um, now speaking with really uh, in terms of working in an institution, which is the National Gallery Singapore, um, we we have one uh, drive, which is really to make. Uh, uh, our archives on, on Southeast Asian art. You know, we want to digitize it. We want to make it available uh, for for researchers or really anyone uh, to have access to, um, and, and to make that you know available and accessible to everyone. So, um, so that's really the main um, initiative. One of our major initiatives that we have been trying to do. So, if you go to um, um, and, and I'm not trying to advertise for the National Gallery of Singapore here, but if you go to the, our library and archives, right, um, we have recently, um, what we have done is to create a search engine that combines um, our archival materials, uh, our artworks, and um, uh, the books in our, in our library together. Yeah, so, so you're able to search all these three um, at once. Um, so for example, if you type in Basuki Abdullah, immediately archival materials, books, and artworks related to Basuki Abdullah in our collection uh, will, will be made available to you as you search it. So, so it's a very powerful um, uh, search engine. Um, and, and for us, you know, the digital office, as you mentioned, you know, Kathleen, about digital technologies, um, this is, this is uh, a really important way uh, in which um, a museum like the National Gallery of Singapore is currently working on. Um, to make all these um, materials and archives, um, knowledge, you know, artwork images um, accessible as much as possible and, and pushing all this out. Um, so for me, that's, that's important and a very concrete way in which you know, we, we operate within this pandemic, you know, as what Carlos said, with limited travel, um, including researchers, you know, um, this is important. Um, so for, for Kathleen's question, yeah, you know, it's, um, I think ASEAN really played a, a very important role and it's under-research and under-acknowledged. Um, and, and Carlos brought it out, you know, through the ASEAN workshops, and was was really critical. Um, uh, and and um, Jim Supanka, you know, um, uh, uh, Marian Marian Pastor Roses, and and also um, I would think um, even Apinan Posnanda. I mean, they 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 they, they, they come out, you know very much all part of this you know connection. Um, if I can think of something that's close, I think Carlos gave us the, the answer, which is the the Japan Foundation. Um, so the Japan Foundation, you know, played played really important role, and you mentioned a number of important exhibitions, like the nineteen ninety two New Art from Southeast Asia uh, exhibition was also particularly uh, important. Um, and I think such uh, cultural agencies uh, have have a very important uh, role to play. Uh, and in particular, I would I would think it's the nineteen nineties. Uh, if you look at, for example. Uh, we have the you know Asian Pacific Triennial. So if you look at from the Australian side, you know that was really important. Um, and if you, do, if you look at um, say the, the inauguration of the Singapore Art Museum in 1996, um, and, and ASEAN you know exhibitions that were also very active in the 1990s. If we, if we trace these histories of exhibitions together, so from the Asia Pacific, from the Australian side, and then you have the Singapore Art Museum. And then you have, um, of course, you know, the ASEAN uh, exhibitions that were still ongoing. We get a better picture of how the region was constructed in the 1990s, I, I believe, will be a very important decade um, to understand that. Thank you, Eugene. Um, uh, all right, we, we might uh, move on a, a little to, uh, um, well, here, here we have this uh, question from Jazreen Harith bin Jeffrey from Malaysia. and. Uh, uh, it, it has, okay, so in light of Korea's success in promoting its creative industries abroad, such as in film and music and television, uh, what kinds of initiatives do you think ASEAN nations would need to implement to take advantage of its own cultural assets? And we'll uh, start with Carlos on this one. I think, yeah, this, is, this webinar series is a very important step towards this direction. Um, for me, because I'm I'm a curator and also an art critic, I think um, having people, more people interested in writing about what's happening in Southeast Asian culture, and um, having projects, designing projects that will promote 
whatever we have, uh, especially in terms of um, the conversations between the member states, is already a big step um, for us because um, we are we have the maritime Southeast Asia, we have the uh, mainland Southeast Asia, so we're we're really um, we really have this distance to um, patch up, and so I think. Um, in relation to your earlier question, the digital media um, projects that uh, involve the digital medium um, is very important, but also um, having specialists um, talk about and research more about what our cultural traditions are, um, where we are headed, and how we are uh, shaping the contemporary moment. Um, is very important and it's a it are very vital um, trajectories to take in relation to um, like um, exploring more of our cultural assets and where we are headed. Thank you, Carlos. Over to you, Kathleen. Um, I guess my question would be actually a return question there about soft power. Like, how do we actually think of soft power? You know, and and what does soft power actually mean? Right. Um, and and I think like this expanding on what uh, Carlos is saying and also in, ex in, in a sense, borrowing from Eugene. Um, you know, what does it mean? You know, this idea of of initiatives that ASEAN nations can create, I would think the, the best way forward in any form of creation of soft power is to think about it in the most generous and broader sense of empowering new narratives, empowering research, empowering art, empowering the people of the nations, right, in, in that sense. And I think that, that when Eugene was talking about what NGS is doing in terms of um, creating public access or as much access as possible through the digital through digital technologies to their collections that provides a certain sense of empowerment and agency and then i would consider that kind of like good soft power so maybe more projects like this as well as this kind of platform where we're sharing from different contexts but also um, support in in a sense empowering each other's narratives right creating more agency in that sense would be a way um that that could work and, and and so in a sense export becomes not so much a one-way relationship and soft power isn't one that's considered one way but is considered as receptacle network building generative thanks ben and and that question is great by the way so, so thank you to the person who asked thanks kathleen eugene yeah i i agree i think um you know, soft power is, is, is really important and how we use it is important. But um, on the other hand, you know, we, we should um, give, and I really like, you know, uh, Kathleen's use of the word, you know, the, um, empowerment. I think that's really important because we should give the space for our artists, you know, to produce their own subjectivities um, and, and of course their own criticalities, you know, as well. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, and, and if we allow that, I think, you know, uh, our artists, um, uh, not just visual arts, but in all, you know, different areas of you know, cultural production or creative production will flourish, you know, and, and, um, and, and actually, I think that's important, you know, we, we must have trust, which is why I brought up the 36 ideas as an exhibition, because there in that exhibition, you just looked at the ideas proposed by of uh, these artists, you know, which was, you know, uh, really 36 ideas from 36 artists. Um, and I think that's important. Um, trust in our artists, um, our creative practitioners, you know, and we'll have our soft power. Thanks, Eugene. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. We've actually had a very comprehensive question come in from Mary Ann M. Lewis from the Philippines. Um, she's raised some very interesting points, but I don't think I'm going to be able to go through all of them, but I'll just raise her last point, and this will be the final question for us today. And um, so, uh, okay, so this point is, with the presentations made, it looks like any form of international cultural event is already a cultural diplomacy engagement. Is there a difference between international cultural promotions vis-a-vis cultural diplomacy, or is it safe to say 
that they are both the same thing. And uh, Carlos, did you get that question? Do I need to repeat it? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Um, it's a very um, <laughs> difficult question to ask. Yes, I like it. Okay. But I think, um, I think for me, uh, I, I would rather um, uh, maintain the distinction um, or distinction of um, cultural diplomatic um, projects um, because it asks us to um, maintain also forms of criticality, as Eugene said, and also um, forms of ethics in terms of what projects you are doing, how we are developing it, um, who are um, benefiting from it. So I think um, those kinds of questions um, are foregrounded in such a term as such a term as uh, cultural diplomacy. Whereas in, in if we just say it's international relations, um, we lose those kinds of attraction in relation to what ethics are we questioning, promoting, or what ethics are we foregrounding um, in these projects? And I think the diplomatic um, as an idea um, has all these productive baggages for all of us who are within its um, uh, entanglements. So definitely, I would think there is a difference. And I think those differences are crucial in um, thinking ahead, what, what happens next in cultural diplomacy, what, what we need to do to um, address the gaps that we still have in terms of understanding uh, other cultures and even our own culture. So I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a very difficult question. And thank yeah. you very much for asking that. <laughs> that excellent response. Thanks, Carlos. <laughs> uh, over to you, Kathleen. Yeah, <laughs> that's a difficult question but also one that I was thinking through when I was putting the presentation together because um, I guess um, my provocation was really to break apart the idea that diplomacy, um, the only actor for, for dip, uh, diplomatic actor possible is the state diplomatic actor, right? And that there is agency on the side of the in individual to intervene into diplomatic into the diplomatic space. And so then the two examples I give you are literally art an artist trying to give an artwork to a country. Um, you know, and, and so I think at the end of the day, when we talk about diplomacy, we're really still going back to the formulation of the nation, right? And I think that this is different than the formulation of working, let's say, internationally, because we have another object in here, which is almost um, conjoined but different, which is the international art world, which is both a marketplace and a different set of systems that is tendential to the diplomatic system. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that on a whole different sphere. And I think that when uh, Carlos, I may be wrong, but I think um, in, in your desire to keep these things different, as different spheres, which I agree with, we need to keep them separate because actually the agency comes from moving between different spheres and activating these different networks and spheres in relation to each other to create new space and interesting things, right? Um, because there, there's limited speech, let's say, if the artist was truly a diplomat, there's limited speech for that artist. But in a sense, the artist acting as an artist in, in diplomatic space then does something interesting because what does it mean to gift a beauty queen to an uh, Indonesian president? Do you know what I mean? Like, like these are interesting things that then we can think about um, that then um, would be different if a diplomat did that. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I do think these, I agree with Carlos completely. These have to be different spaces. And, and I think largely they are because of the protocols around them and and there's a reason for that. And, and they're productive because of that. And they're generative, um, borrowing Carlos's term, which is, I think, the language we're all kind of like morphing towards. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, over to you, Eugene. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think cultural diplomacy, you know, is, is, is important in the sense that it's also very strategic, you know, how we, we want to uh, promote our artists. 
uh, as well. You know, whether is it, um, uh, you know, thinking about um, uh, bringing you know, kind of you know, Southeast Asian art in dialogue with other regions, right? So whether is it Latin America, you know, for example, or, or is it in Europe? Um, I think cultural diplomacy allows us to think of it very strategically. You know, how do we want to have these kinds of cultural dialogues you know, between regions, um, between states? Um, I think that's really important. And, and for me, the main difference is that cultural diplomacy is very strategic. Um, and, and how do we strategize this? Um, I think that's, that's also very important. Um, and I'll just add that, you know, cultural diplomacy itself um, or the, dip the diplomatic core has always been a very important part of um, Southeast Asia's art history. And, and I'll just cite two examples. If you look at in the case of Myanmar and, and Vietnam, you know, say in the 60s and 70s, uh, most of the exhibitions, if you, if you were to kind of trace um, their exhibitionary histories, actually happened uh, with the assistance of the diplomatic um, core, you know, the diplomats, uh, actually, uh, many exhibitions happen in the homes or residences of diplomats um, in, in, in Myanmar, you know, in Yangon, for example, um, and, and the same, you know, happened in, in Vietnam. So, um, uh, you know, they played an extremely important role. I know it's a, it's a bit, you know, um, uh, that, you know, different response to the, to the question, but um, I, was, I would say, yeah, you know, cultural diplomacy um, is, uh, the main difference for me is the, is the strategic aspect of it. Thank you, Eugene. And uh, thank you so much to Carlos, Kathleen and Eugene for their uh, presentations today and um, giving their time and expertise to this webinar uh, on behalf of the ASEAN Foundation, uh, our hearty thank you. And, uh, um, and also from our executive director of the ASEAN Foundation, Dr. Yang Mi Eng, we sincerely thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. And uh, a special thank you, of course, to the Republic of Korea and the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund. And also thank you, Amy, Yona, and Jen, and Ayu, who are backstage, uh, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, despite my own technological uh, mishaps <laughs> and uh, look I, I look forward to seeing everyone again at our next uh, Connect ASEAN Cultural Diplomacy Forum webinar. Thank you very much. Over to you Johnny. Okay uh, thank you uh, panelists for your insights and thank you Ben for moderating this session. Uh, I would like to also thank our attendees in Zoom and Facebook for your engagement in this webinar. If, like me, you want to watch and replay this webinar again, uh, don't worry, since we'll be uploading both the full version and the summary in the form of graph recording, as you have seen before. And with that, we have finally come to an end of, uh, to this webinar. And don't worry, and as there will be still having two more sessions of Connect ASEAN Cultural Diplomacy Forum. So hope you can join us again next time. And the moment you've been waiting for, uh, how to get your certificate. So a survey link will be distributed by the organi organizer in the live video chat, and you just have to fill it completely. The organizers will send the certificate to you to your email within a month. And with that, thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe, and uh, we look forward to Connect ASEAN's future activities. Uh, look forward to Connect ASEAN's future activities. Thank you. with our friends from all folks of life to realize and connect ASEAN together. Come and join us and be part of Connect ASEAN. I see ASEAN as a hope for change.
strength in ASEAN as we always know ASEAN unite each other <laughs> I look forward to the next few discussion that we have mm. and learning things Today's webinar in particular will focus on how arts and culture can make a positive social impact in the post-pandemic world. Online discussions and workshops designed to inspire, educate and contribute towards the important policy work that ASEAN is engaged in. Connect ASEAN heralds a new era of cultural diplomacy and regional integration, signaling both ASEAN's eagerness to revitalize its once integral role in the contemporary arts and Korea's sincerity in establishing closer ties with ASEAN. <laughs>